Hello, I'm Dr. Lauren Osborne. I'm a reproductive psychiatrist, and I work as the vice chair of clinical research in obstetrics and gynecology at Weill Cornell Medicine. And I'm here today to talk to you about a new paper by Sue et al. that was published in the Asian Journal of Psychiatry. It's called Neonatal and Pregnancy Complications Following Maternal Depression or Antidepressant Exposure, a Population-Based Retrospective Birth Cohort Study. So why, why is this paper important? Well, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders are actually the most common complication of childbirth. They're incredibly prevalent, affecting about 15 to 20 percent of moms in the U.S. and more in other settings, particularly in low and middle income countries. We also do a shockingly bad job of treating these disorders. Only about 6% of women with antenatal depression are treated to remission, and only about 3% of women with postpartum depression. When we don't treat these disorders, they're associated with long-term negative impacts for both the mother and the child. They're associated with poor child development in terms of both cognition and emotional social development. They can also be associated with long-term depression for the mom. And of course, they have an association in the worst cases with suicide. Mental health conditions, including suicide, homicide, and substance use conditions, are actually the leading cause of pregnancy-related death. And in the United States, we have a much higher maternal mortality rate than in any other developed country. So this is a real crisis of maternal mortality and understanding how to do a better job treating mental health conditions is a big part of solving that crisis. So what is the point of this paper? Well, there has been a lot of literature about the use of antidepressants in pregnancy. And in fact, they're the best studied class of medications in pregnancy. But a lot of that literature, at least the early literature, was very flawed by comparing groups of women taking antidepressants in pregnancy to women who didn't take antidepressants in pregnancy and were perfectly healthy. Well, those aren't comparable groups, right? If you're taking antidepressants, it's because you have a medical condition. You have depression that you're treating. More recently, people have gotten more sophisticated and have tried to design studies where they're taking out that confounding by indication. So in other words, they're comparing women taking antidepressants with depression to women not taking antidepressants, but who also have depression. This paper it was done in a database in Taiwan, a national database of births. Close to 2 million births is what they started out with. And they had three groups. Those with no antidepressant and no antidepressant exposure. Those with depression and no antidepressant exposure. And those with depression and antidepressant exposure. And they compared those three groups on a variety of both pregnancy complications and neonatal complications. So the great strength of the paper is that it's a very large data set that they've made an attempt to control by indication. Another great strength is their definition of depression. They excluded cases where anybody had fewer than three outpatient visits for depression or had a hospital or didn't have a hospital diagnosis for depression. So in other words, people who maybe made one visit then we're feeling better, didn't follow up. Those people aren't counted as having depression. So we're pretty convinced that the people they count in their depression group actually have depression. So what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses of this paper? And what does the paper find? Well, one of the great strengths, as I mentioned, is a large data set, but that actually also comes into one of the weaknesses. They looked at a huge number of different complications and although they started out with 2 million births, when you get down to some of the nuts and bolts of the very smaller complications, we're talking about very small numbers of births. And it's unlikely that they really had power to detect those differences. So when they find differences in some of these smaller things, they may not. What did they find? They found that mothers with depression who had no antidepressant exposure had increased risks of intrauterine growth restriction and preterm delivery compared to mothers without depression. That's commonly known in the literature, so they've confirmed that finding. In mothers with depression, they found that antidepressant exposure before pregnancy or during the first trimester conferred increased risks of gestational diabetes, malpresentation, preterm delivery, and cardiovascular anomalies, whereas exposure later in pregnancy conferred increased risks of anemia, lower APGAR scores, preterm delivery, and genitourinary defects. But it's not that simple. 
because one of the things that I mentioned before is that when we dial down to these smaller complications, we're actually talking about a very small number of births. So it's really unlikely that they actually had power to make that distinction. The other problem with the approach is that although they've done a great job of trying to account for confounding by indication, they haven't adjusted for confounding by severity. So women who continue to take antidepressants during pregnancy very likely have a much more severe form of depression than women who don't continue to take antidepressants during pregnancy. Moreover, their data set didn't include information about a number of key confounding factors such as alcohol use, smoking, body weight, and other things that we know are different between groups who do and do not have depression. So overall, what's the practical implication of this article? I don't think this article changes anything in terms of our prescribing patterns. We know that perinatal wound anxiety disorders can be severe and affect a large number of women. This article doesn't do anything to increase our concern about the risk. We know that depression itself is associated with preterm birth and intrauterine growth restriction, and that's confirmed in this paper. But the very small risks that they found associated with individual anomalous things, such as low APGAR scores associated with second trimester use of antidepressants, may actually just be flukes based on the very small numbers that they were addressing in that section and may be counted for by either severity or those other factors that are different between groups. So this article doesn't change our practice and should actually reassure us that the risks that we have to prescribing antidepressants are not large, and we know that the risks of not prescribing them are. Thank you very much for your time and attention to this important topic.